Good morning, church. <clears throat> well, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We flew up to Minnesota last Monday, and we got to enjoy some terribly cold weather that we praise God we didn't bring home with us. Uh, we left in the nick of time, too. They didn't have any snow the whole time. It was in like the 20s most of the time we were there, which stinks, but they had snow last night. So praise God for his timing, amen? Today is our last sermon in the book of Matthew before we take a break for a special Advent series. So I want to give you a little preview of that. Starting next week, we'll be walking through a few passages of the Old Testament that foretell of Christ's coming. And we'll have a message from each of the major portions of the Old Testament. So one from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, one from historical narrative, one from the poetic literature, and one from the prophets, as we seek to see Christ in his advent in the Old Testament. Our Advent series will be called Jesus Foretold, just as this series is Jesus Revealed. So that's Matthew's main goal of the book, remember. Today, we get to study a text where Jesus reveals himself even more. As we've been seeing Throughout the book of Matthew, one major way Jesus has been revealing himself, as, as Ed helpfully shared at the top of the service, is in his authority. What does Jesus have authority over? Today's text speaks to that. So let's stand and read Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests." Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And he went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, Which one of you has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was recovered, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Please be seated. As we pray this morning before the text, <clears throat> I wanted to just say a little bit about why we do that. One, to ask you to pray for me as I pray for you and for us. Because today, I, and, and every time I get up here, I need the Holy Spirit to be working. And I need your prayers for that. But also, my voice is going out. And I need your prayers specifically this morning, right now, that it wouldn't. So let's pray. Lord, we desire to know you. We desire to hear and heed your word. And so, Lord, now we submit this time to you. We set it aside and we, we want to concentrate all that we are, our mind, soul, and body, on your word, Lord. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us and that we would be able to mold and shape our lives according to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That's the answer to the implied question raised by today's text. The question is, who has the authority to determine what is lawful on the Sabbath? And it's very clear, reading our text today, that Jesus claims that authority. He is Lord of the Sabbath which means he has the authority to show what is lawful on the Sabbath. <clears throat> but there are two other questions that are important for us to answer. One that we need to answer before we look closer at our text, and one that we need to think about and contemplate after in application. 
The first question is simply, what is the Sabbath? Which is probably an easy question for some of us to answer in this room, but it's important that we know what it is before we tackle the word of God today, because Jesus and his opponents here seem to already know the answer to that question. So let's review for some of us. God built the Sabbath day into creation. He worked for six days, you'll recall, to create the heavens and the earth. But in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we're told, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the Sabbath day. Day, or on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his works that he had done in creation. Now God doesn't get tired. He didn't need a rest. But he tells us that he rested on the seventh day for us to see the importance and holiness of rest from work. God rests from work, so should we. God made that day holy, the seventh day, which is a major point in understanding what the Sabbath is. It's a day set apart, a day where we stop from our normal, even secular work to focus on the Lord. God built this into the society that he founded from the descendants of Abraham. You'll recall the fourth commandment, which says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, But on the Sabbath, seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it shall you do no, you you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Notice the language of Exodus 20 Verses 8 through 11, that's that commandment. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. It sees the foundation of the Sabbath day in creation. The people of God, Israel, were to keep the Sabbath because God rested after he created. And no one is exempt from that rest. Even the travelers in the land and the animals were to observe the Sabbath. So in creation, And then in the society God formed under Abraham and Moses, the Sabbath was built in. The scriptures go on to describe both some nuances and consequences of the Sabbath and breaking the Sabbath. Exodus 31 verse 14 says, You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Hmm. So Sabbath observance was a serious thing. It wasn't an extra spiritual thing. In Numbers 15, we read about a man who was stoned to death after being found gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And this wasn't an angry mob who did this. God told Moses to take the man out of the camp and kill him. Again, the Sabbath was a serious thing. It wasn't optional. The Sabbath, like the other covenant sign of circumcision, was a sign to the world that the people of Israel were set apart. The people of God. Everything about them was holy, even their work week. But Israel didn't do a very good job of keeping the Sabbath throughout their history. Eventually, they looked like all the other nations which means their leaders drove their people to work all seven days without a break, which is a sign for us in Scripture of slavery. Somebody working without rest is a slave. It's oppression. The Sabbath was supposed to be a holy representation that the people of God were not slaves in their work, but servants of God who gave an entire day to him in worship through their rest. Rest from work to concentrate on the Lord is a sacrificial act of worship. So when God kicked Israel out of the land and eventually brought them back under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Sabbath became a central point of devotion for the people of Israel, like it should have been all along. And you can read about that in Nehemiah 9 and 10. 
In the time between Nehemiah and the book of Matthew, the intertestamental period, the 400 years or so there, regulations around the Sabbath became more and more strict until there were 39 specific categories of work that were prohibited for the people of God on the Sabbath, with many more subcategories under those major categories. And the motivation to do this was good. They truly wanted to follow the Lord and keep his Sabbath rest because they hadn't done that. And now they they want to. But as we see in our text today, these regulations themselves became oppressive, a form of stress and even labor. The Sabbath was no longer just a restful day of worship in God's temple or a time to worship in the synagogue as they do in chapter 12 of Matthew. But now it was a stressful day full of inconvenient and oppressive prohibitions. What was once holy and good became a heavy yoke. The Sabbath is a holy day of rest before the Lord. And now that we're all caught up on what that is, a holy day of rest before the Lord, now that we're on the same page, we can engage with the main question of our text today. What is lawful on the Sabbath? Matthew 12 verses 1 through 14, cuts neatly into two portions as it answers that question. The first portion, verses 1 through 8, deals with authority. Authority. Now, remember where we left off in our text last week. Jesus has just said some of the most profound things of the whole book. Remember chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Look back at that with me if you have your Bible. He said to the crowds, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And immediately, Matthew moves on to demonstrate that truth, that Jesus is full of rest for you. He says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. So Matthew sets the scene with all of the relevant details we need. And apparently the disciples who were on their missionary journey are now back with Jesus. And they're walking with Jesus through some grain fields. And crucially, this is happening on the Sabbath. The disciples are hungry So they pluck some grain and they eat. They would have taken a piece of grain from the stock, rubbed it out with their hand to get the husk off, popped it in their mouth as a snack. Now, that's perfectly lawful for them to do. That's okay. They aren't stealing. In fact, Deuteronomy 23, verse 25 says, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Hmm. So the law allowed for you to make a small meal, when you needed of your neighbor's crops, but you weren't allowed to harvest their crops. That would be stealing. So, so far, according to the law, the disciples are good. But verse two tells us that there were some Pharisees around, which I find kind of odd, because they're always lurking. These Pharisees are, why, why are they watching the disciples in a grain field? Okay, they're always lurking. But in verse nine, we read that Jesus enters their synagogue. So they're all with a bunch of people probably on their way to the Sabbath day of worship in the synagogue. There's probably a big crowd around Jesus and his disciples, including these prominent Pharisees as they travel just a short distance to the synagogue, probably in Capernaum. Verse two says, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. They object to the disciples' lunch. Now, why would they be of the opinion that plucking some grain to eat would be breaking the Sabbath? The scriptures do not explicitly say that someone can't pick some grain to eat as a snack on the Sabbath. But according to the rabbinic tradition and the 39 categories of prohibited work, and all the many subcategories under those major categories, the disciples technically, technically reaped grain by plucking, threshed grain by rubbing, and prepared food to eat. They broke the law in at least three ways. 
And all of these activities were considered work and prohibited on the Sabbath. The Pharisees ask Jesus the question. You notice that? They don't address it to the disciples. But that's appropriate. They understood that Jesus, as the disciples' teacher, had authority over them. That what they were doing was because Jesus was okay with it. It was appropriate of the Pharisees to ask Jesus about his disciples' behavior. And Jesus' response is a twofold defense from the Old Testament. First is an example from history, and the second is an example from the law. Both speak to the issue of authority. Jesus is referring to 1 Samuel 21 when he reads, when he, when he says, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? And if you listen, you remember back to 1 Samuel 21, David is on the run from Saul. He's just left his best friend, Jonathan, and he is desperately hungry, and he heads to the tabernacle of the Lord. And he asks for food from the high priest Ahimelech, and the priest tells him the only food that is available is the showbread, or the bread of the presence. And this bread was special. Twelve loaves were made every week on the Sabbath and replaced on the Sabbath, and they sat on a table before the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of the Lord all week. And then they were eaten by the priests and only by the priests and completely by the priests. But Ahimelech offers David this holy showbread to eat so that he doesn't starve. And David takes it and he eats all of it. So why does Jesus bring this up here? Is he saying that like David, his disciples are starving so they can do whatever they want? No, he's, he's not saying David did it, so I can't wait. That's not his point. Jesus is making an argument of authority. Why did Ahimelech give David the showbread to eat? Specifically, David. Because he understood that David was God's anointed. What mattered was the person and the authority that he carried from God. David had the authority to eat the bread of the presence as the anointed of the Lord. But now someone greater than David is here. Someone with even more authority, the greater son of David and the final anointed of the Lord. David was a picture of who Jesus would be. Remember what Jesus said last week. All things have been handed over to me by my father all things. The Pharisees are arguing a technicality from their own hedge and commentary around the law. So Jesus's first argument is like this. If David had the authority to do something that was technically unlawful, even on the Sabbath, how much more do I? He doubles down on his next example from scripture. Verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Of course, there was a lot of work to do in the temple on the Sabbath. Lots of carrying and lots of butchering and burning and walking and pouring and so on and so forth all day long. The priests were expected to do all of these things. But how are they not breaking the Sabbath? Jesus uses a pretty strong word to drive the point home. The priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, which is the same word that we heard from the book of Exodus. You shall not profane the Sabbath. If their work had been done in any other place other than the temple, it would have profaned the Sabbath, but that's Jesus' point. Their work, the priests' work in the temple, doesn't profane the Sabbath because they've been called to that work. The temple, the presence of God, demanded this work to be done. There's an exemption built into their work, and the basis of that exemption was who they were as priests and where they did that work, the temple. Jesus follows up his question with one of the most profound statements we've encountered in the Gospel of Matthew so far. Matthew 
I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you are someone who underlines things in your Bible, that's worth underlining. Something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is talking about himself. He's what's greater than the temple. Now, I know one of my favorite lines to say up here is, um, this is a shocking statement. I say that quite a bit. There's a reason for that. Uh, Oftentimes we fail to absolutely, uh, to, to see the absolutely radical things that Jesus says for what they are. We're so used to the Bible in that way, many of us. They just kind of fly past. And of all the things Jesus has said so far in the Gospel of Matthew, all of the radical, mind-bending, wonderful things he said, an argument can be made that for his original audience, this would have been the most radical. The temple was the most important place in all of Israel. The temple was, wasn't just religiously significant The temple was significant politically. It was significant as a symbol of national pride. It was the central hub for all of Israel, where all of Israel gathered. It was the reason Israel was set apart as the people of God in the first place. The presence of God was in the temple. Why was Israel holy to the Lord? God's presence was with them. And where was God's presence? In the temple. Jesus says something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. He is greater than the temple. So I wonder how the Pharisees would have responded to that. Jesus' point is the most authoritative place in Israel, the place where exemptions for Sabbath regulation can be found every week, has been replaced by the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the greatest presence of the Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. And these two examples speak to Jesus' authority over the Sabbath. He is greater than David, and he is greater than the temple. And this greater than theme will continue on in this chapter as we read verses 41 and 42 in a couple weeks. There we learn Jesus is greater than Jonah and greater than King Solomon. But verse 7, verse 7 here is a rebuke. It's a rebuke specifically of the Pharisees' attitude. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Jesus is quoting from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, which he's already done, if you remember. This is the second time he brings up this text. He quoted it back in chapter 9, verse 13, after he had dinner in Matthew's house. The Pharisees Pharisees don't have mercy in mind. They don't let compassion rule in their hearts. They would rather condemn hungry men for a technicality than make sure that they're fed. And in case we were wondering if the disciples actually did something wrong, If we were wondering, is Jesus making an exemption for them? And would he be mad if somebody else did this? Notice that Jesus calls them guiltless. The disciples are perfectly in the right to pluck some grain and to eat it. But the Pharisees lay an overwhelming, oppressive system of regulations on the shoulders of the people. They think God only wants them to focus on the minutia of keeping the law. They think that God is happy that they formulated 39 different categories of Sabbath regulations. But they fail to understand that while God does want to be worshipped properly, he first wants us to show compassion. The starting attitude for worshipping God is mercy. How often do we focus on the minutia of getting everything right and not have the right attitude in starting our worship before the Lord? Sometimes our whole system of religion in our lives, in our own hearts, can be formulated around proper church attendance and making sure I go to everything that I can. And man, if I don't do this, that, and the other, I'm screwing up. 
But God wants your heart to be right first. And we're told here that a right heart is oriented correctly toward other people. It's a heart of mercy. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees are motivated not by love and mercy. They're motivated by their own piety and their wrong understanding of what God wanted from them. But right relationship with the Lord always results in right relationship with others. A merciful, compassionate attitude. So if we see ourselves reflected in the Pharisees this morning, now's a chance to examine our hearts. Who has the authority to determine what is lawful on the Sabbath? Well, verse 8 answers that question clearly. Jesus says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And as we've seen, Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. It's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man is given all authority from God in heaven. The Son of Man, Jesus, is also Lord of the Sabbath. Lord, of course, means the person with supreme sovereign authority. That's what Jesus is claiming here on the Sabbath. Supreme sovereign authority. Authority. The Lord of the Sabbath gets to show what the Sabbath really means. Jesus has the authority to determine what is lawful on the Sabbath and how it applies to his people. He gets to decide what the Sabbath means for the kingdom of heaven. That's the point of verses 1 through 8. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He has all authority. Matthew's theme of authority of Jesus is, again, on clear display here. In verses 9 through 14, in those verses, Jesus will demonstrate that authority as he shows the Pharisees, second, the right Sabbath priorities. As we saw in verse 7, the Pharisees are prioritizing ritual over compassion, sacrifice over mercy. But Jesus shows them what it looks like when we prioritize mercy over sacrifice. Verse 9 says, he went on from there and entered their synagogue. So Jesus goes to the local synagogue, probably the synagogue in Capernaum, and Matthew wants us to understand that this is happening on the same day. That's how he's telling his story. So right from his conversation with the Pharisees about his authority as Lord of the Sabbath, he goes on to their synagogue. And notice that Matthew calls it their synagogue. And Matthew did this previously at the beginning of chapter 11, where he tells us that Jesus went around to their cities. In this context, the there in question is probably the Pharisees. Although, if this is in Capernaum, then Jesus would have had just as much right to claim this as his synagogue. So Matthew is trying to distance Jesus once again. He's trying to distance Jesus from this place and to demonstrate the growing opposition to Jesus in the region of Galilee. Every single word in the Bible matters, even a pronoun like there. Matthew tells us that there was a man with a withered hand at the synagogue, which doesn't give us much detail about this particular handicap, although maybe we can use our imaginations to picture what a man with a withered hand or maybe a withered arm looks like. A best guess would be that the man's arm was injured somehow, and it had atrophied and become unusable, even, even paralyzed, as some versions say. And upon seeing this man, the Pharisees have a great idea. Why don't we make a test? They ask, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Which math, Matthew includes then their, their motive, so that they might accuse him. Notice that. Their answer to this question, the Pharisees' answer to this question, would have been easy. It would have been no Unsurprisingly, healing, miraculous healing, was not one of the 39 categories of prohibited works. There weren't many professional miraculous healers out there. But maybe surprisingly, healing was prohibited by the oral tradition and the commentary set around even those 39 prohibitions. A man was not supposed to receive medical attention if the wound was not life-threatening on the Sabbath. Jesus is well aware of this. 
So are his opponents. That's why the test is brought up. They ask the question to see if Jesus respects the oral tradition. Jesus responds in verse 11, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Now, Jesus' response to us seems like common sense. Of course, I'm going to save my animal from the pit. But it's more interesting than it first seems. He's now referencing the oral tradition and a debate going on amongst the Pharisees and commentators around those 39 regulations set up. Some commentators said that you couldn't help an animal out of a pit on the Sabbath, but most disagreed. Deuteronomy 22 verse 4 explicitly says, listen to this, you shall not see your brother's donkey or ox fallen by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. The law explicitly states you have to help animals out. And based on that scripture, it was expected that a person would help their neighbor with their animal. How much more would you be expected to help your own? But the question is, should they do so on the Sabbath? And the question is centered on what law is prioritized? If we're not allowed to lift things above our head on the Sabbath, if we're not allowed to exert ourselves on the Sabbath in such and such a way, what law do we prioritize? And most scribes said that it was better to prioritize the good rather than to let the animals suffer. So most scribes gave provisions for people to care for hurt animals who hurt themselves in some way, like falling into a pit. Like maybe they shouldn't go grab them and drag them out, but they could throw something in to help the animal climb out, or they could provide food to the animal to last the night. And some commentators even did say it was perfectly fine to lift the animal out of the pit. Now, this discussion is all theoretical. In practice, normal people who operate on common sense wouldn't leave their animal to suffer and die in a pit. They'd quickly go get the animal to safety. So, you couldn't heal a man who wasn't in mortal danger on the Sabbath according to the oral tradition. But, according to that same conflicting oral tradition, you could help an animal who fell in a pit, on the Sabbath, somehow. That's Jesus' point in verse 12. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Jesus, as he often does, is arguing from the stronger to the lesser. If you can do this thing, like save a sheep, then you should be able to do this thing, like help a man. To demonstrate the truth, Jesus tells the man to stretch out his hand. And Matthew tells us, the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. As always happens in the Gospel of Matthew, the man is healed instantly and fully. Matthew even tells us that his hand was healthy just like the other one. His withered arm, with no no muscle, unusable, even paralyzed, was, as he stretched it out, restored and looked just like the other, completely healed, healthy, and strong, which is a pretty amazing miracle to have witnessed. You know, imagine somebody just stretching out their arm and it growing muscle miraculously, and health, and looking exactly like the other hand, and its usability. Man, that's mind-blowing. And Jesus, because he's full of compassion, heals the man, and and his life is changed. He wasn't just suffering with an unusable hand, you know. He's probably not even been able to provide for his family to work. He's maybe even even lost work, or maybe been unable to tend his farm. Now he's whole again, and the, the Pharisees just wanted to use him as a test case. They didn't care about the man's suffering goes back to Jesus' point in verse 7. But Jesus restores the man. He doesn't just get into a theoretical conversation with the Pharisees. The man is healed. Because that's the work Jesus came to do. He came to restore man to what he was originally created to be. He came not to fix every physical issue, but to restore the marred image of God in each one of us. When Jesus went to the cross to die for sinners, he dealt with each of our withered, unusable souls. 
And he's restored us back to life, resurrected us, praise the Lord. But you can see how this affected the Pharisees. Verse 14 says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. This is the first time in the gospel we're told that people wanted Jesus dead. The opposition that had been growing is only strengthened by this encounter. This is what sent them over the edge, it seems. And you might be wondering why this was the last straw for the Pharisees. Well, if Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath, if Jesus calls himself greater than the temple, and if he alone has the authority to determine what is lawful on the Sabbath, and if he alone is able to demonstrate that authority, then of what use are the scribes and Pharisees? in all of their commentary, in all of their interpreting of the law, in all of their systems of regulations, in subcategories under 39 already existing categories. Jesus isn't just healing someone here. He's saying, out with all of this oral tradition and system of legalism you've set around the good law. This is of no use. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Only Jesus is needed. Only Jesus is needed to understand everything, including the Sabbath. He is the final authority, Lord. And there's nothing like feeling powerless to make a man want to murder. But as we wrap up today, it's important that we tackle the last question. It's a very practical question, and one that many Christians struggle with on their conscience. How should we practice the Sabbath? Well, first of all, remember, Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Matthew starts there back in chapter 5, so should we. So in one very important and primary sentence, Jesus is our Sabbath. Let Let me say that again. In our primary understanding of how we should follow the Sabbath the first thought we should have is Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest, our Sabbath holy rest before the Lord. In Christ, we find rest for our souls, as we read in chapter 11, verse 29. He has enabled us to rest from the work of self-righteousness and to find Sabbath in him, reconciliation and restoration before our Father in heaven. Now, In another sense, Jesus fulfills the Sabbath in that he reorders it for us or reorients it for us, gives us a fuller understanding. He is the Lord of the Sabbath and he alone interprets how his people will follow it. So we still have the Ten Commandments today. We still believe that those are the word of the Lord and that they are relevant to define righteous living. The Sabbath regulation from the Ten Commandments hasn't gone anywhere. And early Christians certainly observed the Sabbath. But we don't follow the Ten Commandments as a regulation of a nation state. So there is a differentiation between the nation of Israel and the church. We are not Israel in that sense. The Sabbath had a particular significance for that nation. So our observance of the Sabbath in the church age today is different than what it was for the nation of Israel. In fact, Differences in Sabbath observance happened almost immediately in the early church. After the temple was destroyed in AD 70 and Christians and Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem, the whole church gradually started to meet on what they called the Lord's Day, which is our Sunday. Early church documents like the Didache instructed churches to meet on the day the Lord raised from the dead. Some have said this is the wrong thing to do, so they have chosen to meet on Saturdays. Regardless, because Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Sabbath rest for us, strict observance of a particular day is not as important for Christians as it was for the nation of Israel, because Jesus is our Sabbath. For instance, no one is in mortal danger from being stoned to death if they don't observe the Sabbath, because Jesus is our Sabbath. Nevertheless, regularly observing a Sabbath rest is a spiritual discipline that we should all foster in our own hearts. God did not just build the Sabbath into the law for Israel. Remember, he built it into creation 
So in practice, the Sabbath should be kept as holy, as a spiritual discipline. And we should do the things the people of God have always done on the Sabbath day. We should rest, rest physically, leaving our work behind. We should recreate and have fun and enjoy God's creation and our relationships together. And we should worship, which is the major function of the Sabbath. And as Jesus significantly tells us here in verse 12, we should do good on the Sabbath. Jesus ends the debate completely right there in verse 12. Did you notice the word lawful throughout the text? It's a key word for for verses 1 through 14. What is lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus' explicit and only answer to that question here is, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So here's my encouragement to you on how to observe the Sabbath as informed by Scripture. First, take a day off. Take a day off. Leave your work at work, even if it's really important. Leave your work at work. Sleep in if possible. Do something fun. Spend time with family. First, take a day off. Second, worship God on that day off. The best way to take a day off in order to accomplish the goal of Sabbath rest is to take it off when you can meet with the church. Take it off on Sunday. Go to church, meet with the body. Go to church and hear the preaching of the word. Participate in congregational singing. You need the body of Christ. You need it. And it needs you. Set aside time to worship as a family. Set aside time to read the word for yourself and spend time in prayer. You know, often we feel guilty that we can't get in the word every day or spend time in deep prayer every day. And, you know, that should be a goal. We should desire to be in the word as often as we can be. But, you know, there's a built-in wonderful blessing from God that has given us, uh, that he has given us that, that completely takes that guilt away. It's the Sabbath. Taking a day off from work is great. But be intentional with your Sabbath. Rest and worship the Lord in that rest. Set aside, aside time on the Sabbath to have for prayer and to have for the word. The worship we experience on the Sabbath is supposed to energize us for our next week of work, both as members of society and our jobs and as Christians seeking to extend the kingdom of God. So rest is needed, but specifically worshipful rest is needed. A time to gather, to hear the word, to sing, to have your heart filled up by fellow Christians in the church, and a time of rest before the Lord by yourself, even with your family. Take a day off from work. Worship the Lord on that day off. Best time to do that is Sunday. Best time to do that is Sunday. Doesn't have to be. There's no hard and fast rules. But the best time to do both of those things is on a Sunday. Third, do good on the Sabbath. Take someone out to lunch after church. Provide for someone's needs. Visit someone in the hospital. It is lawful, Jesus says, to do good on the Sabbath. That's what we should prioritize, doing good to one another. Mercy, not just sacrifice. Okay, but this brings up a question, Jesus' statement in verse 12. What is unlawful? It's a question that weighs on our consciences. Now, remember, Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. But we are still responsible to observe the Sabbath, even as Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. So here are a couple of questions to ask yourself if you're not sure something would be a a good thing to do on the Sabbath. Some questions. First, is it work-related? Is the thing you want to do work-related? Sometimes that's unavoidable. Some of us own businesses. Some of us have a lot of employees we have to manage. So sometimes it's unavoidable. But on principle, seek to set aside your job on the Sabbath. Set it aside. Don't go to it. Try not to think about it. Second, second question. Does it cause goodness and the gospel to spread? A work meeting might not be a good thing to schedule on the Sabbath. 
but maybe a tough meeting, just as stressful or more stressful, a tough meeting with a brother in Christ would be a good thing to schedule on the Sabbath. Final question. Does it put undue stress upon you and cause you to not find rest? Now, this is the most nuanced question and the question you should ask yourself last. Many of us have children, and children are stressful. And we don't lock them in their rooms on the Sabbath because we get stressed out by them. But what about certain things like uh, planning a massive three-course meal that will take you all day to fix? Or what about fixing that part of the house that you've been needing to get to that's going to take you all day with a bunch of back-breaking labor? That's what Saturdays are for. Make sure your Sabbath is a restful time with the Lord, with the body of Christ, and with your family. Now, again, these aren't hard and fast rules, and a lot of it comes to conscience. Some of us will be uncomfortable doing certain things other people are comfortable with, but we can't ignore the Sabbath, especially since Jesus doesn't ignore the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, and we worship that Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we desire to do what you command us to do. And some of these issues like Sabbath observance are sometimes difficult for us, especially if we haven't had the discipline of taking a Sabbath rest. So Lord, first we just hand this to you. We ask for the ability and the strength to do this, for your guidance on how that looks pra- practically in our lives with everything going on. Lord, we pray for help and knowing where to cut things out and things not to do on a day of rest. But Lord, we worship you this morning. We worship you because you are our Sabbath. Jesus, you are God with us. You have come to fulfill the law, and we worship you for that. We worship you that we don't have heavy burdens of regulation laid upon our shoulders, but that we can turn to you and find rest for our souls because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen.